We're going to have concentration on sanctification this morning. Because I played a lot of games growing up. I played Monopoly and Trouble and Solitaire and this game called Sorry. And I played Concentration, the card game, on the card table with my grandmother, laying them all out, picking up the card, trying to match the one to the other. And, um, and that was fun and easy. If the cards don't match, you turn them back over, try again, and try to remember, and you have to concentrate. Where did I see that card? This was a game show once upon a time. And they had a grid where you would turn the um, numbers. And <laughs> then they also had numbers and pictures and puzzles. So as you turned it and you matched things up, then you'd also try to solve the puzzle. We're going to kind of play concentration today in a little bit. This is a good word to apply to our consideration of sanctification. Concentration. To concentrate is to fix your attention on something, to pay close attention to something. And this is the basis for Paul's exhortation to the Thessalonians. Pay close attention, concentrate on this verse, which you have been seeing through your homework. <coughs> concentrate on this verse. Paul said, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you may excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. There's a lot of information in these three verses, but we're going to look at the main challenge that Paul gives. He says, we request that you may excel still more. Excel still more in what? It's in walking according to the commandments of Jesus. Excel still more in pleasing God. Paul acknowledges here that the Thessalonians are living according to the instruction that he gave them. They are already following the commandments of Jesus. We've seen Paul commend them for their faith and love, their labors of love, their acts of faith. But he uses almost the same word here in chapter 4, verse 1, that he used when he prayed for them in chapter 3, verses 9 and 12. He prayed exceedingly that their love would overflow, abound. He used the word parasuo, that their love would abound. And he uses the word parasuo here. It's translated in the verse I just showed you as excel. Parasuo means to abound, to be abundantly supplied, to be over and above, to be advanced. This might be a review for those of you who looked it up in your homework last week. Parasuo. The verb to excel, going beyond, keeping on, increasing, overflowing. And I want to show you the four verses where he uses this same word or a version of this word. First Thessalonians 3, 9 and 10. I mentioned that. He said in verse 10, we pray earnestly. And here it's hooper ek parasu. And then in verse 12, may the Lord cause you to increase and with love. So there it is in black and white for you to see what I was referring to. And then in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, just to highlight it, do so even more, parasuo, excel. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10, he says, about brother brotherly love, you don't need me to write you because you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. In fact, you are doing this toward all the brothers in the entire region of Macedonia. But we encourage you, brothers, to do so even more. Parasuo, abound, overflow, keep going, more and more, more and more. Excel in this. Paul urges the Thessalonians to excel, to walk in God's ways, to please him even more. They were doing well. Get that in your heads. They were doing well. But Paul wanted them to keep going, keep pursuing, pleasing God, 
even more in a way that was over and above what they were already doing. He wanted them to become spiritually extraordinary. How would you like to be encouraged that way? Become spiritually extraordinary. Excel to a higher degree of pleasing God. Weren't they doing enough already? Weren't they living out their faith in the midst of persecution? Weren't they sharing the gospel everywhere? And Paul wanted to see more. Weren't they already known for their love? But Paul said, that's not enough. More, 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 more. <laughs> Keep on. What was the reason? It's found in the previous prayer before 1 Thessalonians 4.1. And it's pr found in the following statement. He prayed for the believers to be blameless in holiness. And he prayed this because and said, this is God's will for you, your sanctification. So, again, why is Paul praying this? Because until we have arrived in God's presence, we have not arrived in perfect, completed sanctification. And that's why we must press on in sanctification. You know this. I'll just say it again. Until we have arrived in God's presence, we have not arrived in perfect, completed sanctification. And that's why we must press on in sanctification. So don't let anybody around you tell you, you got it made. <coughs> you're, don't, you're, don't try any harder. Just, just stay where you are. Don't do that. John MacArthur says, there is always a danger of Christians thinking they have no further need to progress in sanctification. But this side of eternity, no believer has even come close to what God desires for him spiritually. Because it knew so much truth, even a church as strong as the one in Thessalonica might have been tempted to settle for the spiritual status quo. Thanks to Paul's solid instruction when he was with them, the saints were living exemplary lives and he had commended them for that. As a result, they might have thought their condition was ideal and in no need of improvement. So even the encouragement, hey, you're doing a good job. You might be like, okay, good. No, he doesn't let them stay there. Paul knew they could do better and he encouraged them accordingly. Even Paul himself knew that he himself could excel more in pleasing God. When he was in prison in Rome at the end of his ministry, he wrote to the church at Philippi, Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Not that I have already reached the goal or am already fully mature, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. You can see him. He sees he has not crossed the finish line. So he is still pursuing, reaching forward, upward. Well, I want to concentrate on the concept of sanctification now. To some, it might be a vague doctrinal word. To others, this word is a beautiful summary of the transformation that God is bringing about in our lives. Here's my concentration game grid. In my game here, you can't lose. <laughs> uh, if we try to match words and phrases together so that we understand the meaning of sanctification, what you're going to see is that all of the words on this grid do match. They correspond to each other. They carry the same concept underneath them. They convey almost the same meaning. And I don't have a grid to turn like Vanna White has. I know that's Wheel of Fortune, but I can't do that. So I had to just pick them and you know, set the stage for you. We're going to start with number one and the words that you've been looking at this week, holiness. Hagia Sunni is 
the Greek word for holiness, a state of being holy. And in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, sanctification is the Greek word hagiasmas, the process of making holy. So right at the beginning, I hope you can see the similarity between those two words. And, and I've actually, I mean, hagias, hagiasuni, holiness. Hagiasmas, sanctification. What do these words have in common? Holiness. They both have that hagias as a core part of the root word. Where does holiness come from? It comes from our holy, holy, holy God. He's the one and only holy one. So before we can go any further regarding sanctification in our lives right now, we must concentrate on the holiness of God. The defining characteristic of God, the defining characteristic of God is holiness. Everything that he is is because he is holy. The very basic meaning of holiness is set apart and God himself as the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is completely set <coughs> apart in his very being from everything and anything else because he was before anything else. He made it all. God is someone completely different and other than any creature. You're perhaps looking at Exodus 15, 11. It says, who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? Because God's holiness is his otherness, it means that God is absolutely separate from and exalted above all of his creatures. We didn't put him there. He was already there because he was before we were. And God is equally separate from all moral evil and sin. So I hope that if you haven't already heard this explanation from me about the holiness of God at some Bible study in the past, see that the holiness of God is not just that he is separate from evil. It is he that he is separate and other than evil everything. Think about the fact that we all have a lot in common. You can look around the room. We're all women. That's the first thing. <laughs> we are all humans, but we have something in common with trees. We have something in common with angels. Those three categories are all created we share something in common with each other. <laughs> but God doesn't share that in common with us. He created us. So just emphasizing once again his otherness as his, an aspect of his holiness. On your handout, you have a summary of God's holiness from Roy Beecham. Holiness is that quality of God, which embodies the totality of his unique godness and sets him apart from all that is created and mundane, both in being and character. God's holiness in being is demonstrated by his majesty, which is too great and too extreme to be expressed in words. God's holiness in character finds expression in his purity, which cannot be marred and is too important to ignore. Now, our God is a big God, and he is holy, holy, holy. And this is something that we don't see on earth around us. And we've seen it demonstrated in the life of Christ. And we are given as much explanation and revelation about God as he has chosen to reveal of himself. But how can you grasp this that's not what you see around you? I encourage you to go back and reflect on and reread some of these statements about the holiness of God. Because for me to say them is not something that you're just going to like, oh, I got it. <laughs> this is worth meditating upon, God's holiness. 
Again, Exodus 15, 11 is another good verse to just be still with. Lessons that we must learn from God's holiness are that because God is holy, he hates sin. Because God is holy, there is a chasm between God and the sinner. But God did something about that. Because God is holy, man must approach God in holiness. And the only way to do that is through being made holy through the blood of Jesus. And I actually emphasize those words instead of the blood of Jesus. Now, I want to emphasize the blood of Jesus. We're made holy through the blood of Jesus. But God has made a way for us to be made holy through the blood of Jesus. And who's doing the work there? Jesus is. You're responding to it. And number four, because God is holy, we must approach him with reverence and awe and obedience. That's where we are walking in cooperation and we are pursuing the holiness of God. What pleases him, what he has told us to do. Well, now we're going to get back to our grid and our concentration on sanctification. So... Um, no matter which number you pick, it's all going to match. Let me show you the first ones here. Godliness, blamelessness, pleasing God, transformation. All of these words describe the way that we are to be and how our character is expressed. All of these are concepts that are just different terms indicating that our lives are to match up to God. So how we are to be, how our character is to be expressed. And I have a lot more words to share with you. Perfection. You saw that from Matthew 5. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Spiritual growth is going to be evidence that you are pursuing the character of Christ in your life. Christ likeness, following Jesus, being conformed to the image of Christ. He is the one that we're looking at. We are to be a slave of righteousness. This is a good thing. This is the kind of slave that we should be. What are some more words? Righteousness. That is a word that parallels and will be uh, evidenced as we are going through the process of sanctification. Um, walking worthy of God, honoring God, obeying him, fearing God. Fearing God is a good thing. You fear God when you recognize who he is in all of his holiness and glory and majesty and sovereignty, and he is the judge. He makes the decisions. He makes the decrees. He's, he says, this is the way it is. And so we fear him and trust his ways. Matthew Henry says that 1 Thessalonians 4.2 is an exhortation to abound in holiness, to abound more and more in a holy walking, and to excel in those things that are good. Those who most excel others still fall short of perfection. The very best of us should press on to what is ahead of us. We must not only persevere to the end, but we should grow better and walk more evenly and closely with God. And I've underlined what you see in the middle there. Those who most excel others still fall short of perfection. We know that. There is not one saint in the Old Testament or the New Testament or at any time in Christian history that has achieved complete, perfect, final sanctification on this earth. You're not finished <laughs> while you're here. So we must press on to excel more and more in following God and pleasing him. This is the process of sanctification. There's good news. For those who have received salvation, sanctification has already begun. The stage of sanctification is already complete. 
So I want to give you a few statements about sanctification and show you some stages of sanctification. First of all, Wayne Grudem's book, Systematic Theology, has a chapter entitled Sanctification, Growth in Likeness to Christ. So if, if you need a very simple definition of what sanctification is, if you're trying to wrap your mind around that concept, there you go, growth in likeness to Christ. And first we have an introduction. As a whole, what you have is sanctification, a progressive work that continues throughout our earthly lives. It's also a work in which God and man cooperate, each playing distinct roles. Sanctification as a whole is a progressive work of God and man that makes us more and more free from sin. Hooray! <laughs> and more and more like Christ in our actual lives. Hooray for that too. <laughs> so that's an overview, an introduction. And now, three stages. Stage one. Oh, I moved. Okay, stage one is sanctification at salvation. At salvation. Emphasize that, please. Sanctification has a definite beginning. And with its beginning, it has an impact. And this happens at regeneration. Regeneration is salvation. 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, You were washed, you were sanctified. Past tense, it happened. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. The initial step in sanctification involves a definite break from the ruling power and love of sin so that the believer is no longer ruled or dominated by sin and no longer loves to sin. If you find that you are loving to sin, repent <laughs> and look at the Lord and remember that he has made a change in your life. So the statements that I've just made in this sanctification at salvation tells us two things. This is a situation where we will never be able to say, I am completely free from sin. Why is that? Galatians 5.17, Paul tells us, the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And the language of this says, these are always opposed to each other. This is going to go on in your life on earth. While this is um, a frustrating situation, <laughs> it is also helpful to recognize the reality of it and let it be a reminder to continue fighting against the temptation to sin. The second aspect uh, that we need to recognize because we have been sanctified, because the change was made at salvation, we can never say, this sin has defeated me, I give up. Why? Romans 6, 14, sin shall not be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Is there something that you are fighting? You are not under sin as it being your master. Who is your master? The Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is greater than the sin and anything else. So yield to the Holy Spirit and his urging. All of this is good news. We have been sanctified. Past tense. It has happened. Stage one. You have been sanctified. Hebrews 10.10 10 says we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. His body was offered once and for all. We have been sanctified. It happened. It changed us. But that was just the beginning of the story. So now we'll think about stage two. Stage two is sanctification continuing. Sanctification continues and increases throughout life. And this is what we call progressive sanctification. This is the stage of sanctification that's usually referred to when the word is used in our conversations. Sanctification is happening. That's going on right now. 
this is what Paul was referring to in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, when he said the will of God is your sanctification, your progressive increase in holiness, your progressive continuing increase in Christ likeness, your continued yielding of yourselves to righteousness. That's being a slave to righteousness. Romans 6, 19, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Paul tells the Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 22 through 24, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. There it's telling you again what God did at salvation was to create you. You're a new creation and he created you in holiness by cleaning you up, separating you from the sinful, old, dead heart and putting the new in you, giving the Holy Spirit to you. That's what's new in you. But Ephesians tells us, put off the old, renew your mind, put on the new. These are actions that are our responsibilities during this process of sanctification. Putting off unholy, unworld, uh, well, unworldly, worldly behavior. It's unheavenly. <laughs> it's worldly, earthly behavior. We want to put that off and put on the behavior that pleases God. That's what Paul is lovingly urging the Thessalonians to do throughout the rest of this letter. And we looked briefly at the topics that he covered. Paul urged the Thessalonians to do their part but he knows it's not just up to them. It's not just up to us. How do we know that? Let's look at some of these things that we've seen and just be reminded that he is praying. He says, we know brothers loved by God that he has chosen you. So this whole thing started when God did something. He chose you. And Paul said, walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Again, God is at work. And Paul prayed that Jesus would establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father. So here, who's working? Jesus is working. And then back to the verse I started with, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, Paul urged that they do their part. We ask and urge you, as you receive from us how you ought to live, do so more and more. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And then he ends in prayer. So he's praying. This is all wrapped up in trusting God, looking to him, knowing he is doing his work in us. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he surely will do it. God calls you. God is faithful. He will do it. He will do what? He will sanctify you completely. It's such good news. We can trust him and be very excited about the goal that he has for us. Sanctification is the progressive work of God and man. We are to pursue the holiness of God in our lives, knowing that he is transforming us into the image of Christ. What a beautiful goal he has. What a beautiful person he looks at. Jesus is amazing. People saw him. They followed him. They loved him. They saw his goodness, his wisdom, his obedience to everything that God laid out. God is transforming us so that we will be like him. 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all with unveiled faces are reflecting the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image 
from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. This verse says that we with unveiled faces are reflecting the glory of the Lord. We are looking to the Lord. We must continually keep the holy majestic character of God before us and fix our attention on God. Concentrate on him because it's only in the light of God's great holiness that our sinfulness will even look sinful to us. Self and Satan will say, ah, you don't look so bad. <laughs> or you're a better Christian than that one over there. That's not the right voice to listen to. We must compare ourselves to the only one who is perfect. And when you compare yourself to God, when you compare yourself to Jesus, you know you're not there yet. <laughs> Paul's exhortation to excel still more and more in pleasing the Lord is what we all need to hear because there is a battle going on with the flesh. Jonathan Edwards was a young man and he made many resolutions. One of them was resolved never to give over nor in the least to slacken my fight with my corruption. However unsuccessful I may be, this is the don't quit concept. Stay with the fight against sin. Don't stop fighting the flesh even if you lose a few battles. And then one day in the future, we will arrive at the third stage of sanctification. Sanctification completed. Once we die and go to be with the Lord, our souls are set free from indwelling sin and are made perfect. Nothing unclean enters the presence of God. And then whether it happens at the same time, like rapture, which we'll talk about next week, but, or if you die and then rapture happens, when our physical bodies are resurrected, they will be changed to be completely holy with no blemish or defect from sin. The third stage of sanctification, as you can see, is called sometimes perfect sanctification, or it might be called glorification. Glorification is when the soul and the body are united and the body is completely remodeled by God's amazing power and ready for uh, eternity. First John 3, 2. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him as he is. And Philippians 3.21 gives us this great goal again. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. If you want to know what you're going to look like, look at what Jesus looked like after his resurrection. He had a glorified body. And now I want to show you this chart. This shows us that we are slaves to sin before salvation. In the pit of depravity, there's no way out. And God rescues us. He picks us up out of that pit of being slaves to sin. There is a definite beginning point of salvation and sanctification. Definite change. And we are new creations from this point forward. And then you see sanctification should increase. It should excel and abound throughout our Christian lives. And there is a upward toward heavenward increasing progressing climb. There's that jagged line, though. It shows that sanctification is not always one directional. <laughs> there, most of the time we should be progressing forward, upward, but sometimes we regress. And that is yucky. But it was really helpful to me when I understood that does happen because I was very upset that I it was not on a, a straight upward, you know, uh, progression. Well, let me show you something that doesn't happen. We don't just get saved and immediately go straight up. Okay. <laughs> you don't. That's, 
That's not the way it works. So that's just a reminder. And then something else we should be aware of is that this is a little bit of a straight line. It's almost a plateau. And you don't want to think, I made it here. And I'm going to stop here. And this is good enough. Because that's not all the way. And uh, that, too, is what Paul is pointing out to us and urging us is to press on. Do not get stagnant. Don't think that you have arrived. This chart shows us why Paul urged us to excel more and more. The most important thing is not that we are concentrating on ourselves in this process, but we are concentrating on focusing on our God in his holiness. So let's fix our eyes, fix our attention on him. Charles Spurgeon said, the highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy, which can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the work, the doings, and the existence of the great God whom he calls his father. It's concentration on our God that brings about sanctification. Concentration on sanctification. Concentration on our God. The more you know Him, the more you will pursue Him and be like Him. And one day be stamped sanctified completely. And we will see each other in that state. What a beautiful day that will be to see how God reconstitutes our bodies and brings us to his presence, glorified, done. <laughs> it will be so good. Let's pray. Lord God, our heavenly Father, you are in heaven, you are holy. You know what's going on from your vantage point. You know what you want in our lives. You know what you have decreed and ordained. And you know what is good. You do what is good. Thank you for sending Jesus that we can see what it looks like for a human to walk obediently before you and to love you and to love others. And I thank you for his words. I thank you for Paul's words. Thank you for the things that you have stirred up this week and brought to our attention and brought your holiness to our attention. But you are urging us through Paul to excel and to pursue holiness, to pursue your holiness. Lord, may we do that and may we be the light in this world that you want us to be, a reflection of you, your goodness, your holiness. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you live in us and you work on us and you live through us. So I ask you to show us today and in the days to come the areas that you want to make changes, what you want to do, and how you want us to excel more and more in particular things and what it may be that we need to see cleaned up and put away and gotten rid of out of our lives. I thank you that you comfort us and encourage us and you love us. And we praise you for your grace, all of your work on us and for us. We love you, our God. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.